my pleasure to introduce Joel Cardella. He has over 24 years of experience in IT, ranging from everything from network operations, sales engagement, uh, to information security. Uh, before uh, working at Rapid7, he has worked in multiple ver verticals, including telecom, healthcare, and ma uh, manufacturing. Joel will be speaking to us about welcome to the world of yesterday, tomorrow. Thanks, Joel. And none of that matters. Thank you very much. I do not, I do not purport, to be, purport to be a an authority on anything. So let's frame the discussion there. Uh, my name is Joel Cardella. I work in uh, for Rapid Seven Global Services. I want to talk to you today about some things that I'm calling part of a storytelling series. And our story begins in 1986, January 28th, 1986, at 11:39 a.m the Space Shuttle Challenger lifted off the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. This was the 25th mission of the shuttle series, and it was a very special mission for some very special reasons that we're gonna talk about and find out about. 73 seconds after liftoff, the right solid booster, solid rocket booster dislodged, there was an explosion, and three minutes later, all hands were lost. <clears throat> what went wrong? NASA had a very specific plan to create a program of reusability. And that program included managing the risk of human lives in space. This is the 30th anniversary of STS-51L, which is the Space Shuttle Challenger. This is all about managing risk, and that's what the topic is today. So I'm gonna illustrate for you the shuttle program, what happened in the shuttle program, and how NASA, who has a very rigid risk management program, actually failed themselves by ignoring some of the rules and things that they had set in place specifically to deal with human lives. And we'll have to talk about the, the shuttle program. We'll have to kind of go back in time and, and look at the, the things they did. And we're going to learn some, some names and things. And I'm going to throw a lot of names at you, but there's really only a couple of names I want you to focus on. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But really, again, this is a talk about managing risk. We want to learn from the lessons of our past so we don't repeat them. So again, we don't want the world of yesterday, tomorrow. We really like that the other way around. So the shuttle program. When the shuttle program was officially launched, it was known as the Space Transportation System, STS. Um, it was a US government launch, manned launch program. It ran from 1981 to 2011. It was designed to be reusable, and that's really, really important. Because prior to that, we did not have any kind of reusability. We had rockets that we would build, we would send them into space, the rockets would explode, and the money would be lost, that would be it. So we started talking about how can we get something that's recoverable so we can actually make space travel economical and affordable. We can send things up, we can bring them down. That's what SpaceX is doing today. When they're launching their rockets out into space and then bringing them back down in that amazing platform on rough seas, right? The Dragon X, like the most amazing video I think I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I've seen all this stuff. I was alive when they were launching the space shuttles, which was the most amazing thing, right? When we can get to the point where we can recycle this stuff, we get to this point where, wow, economics doesn't become such a huge factor and we can actually do something with this technology. We can make it into something. That's really exciting. And that's what the driver is for the space shuttle program. There was 135 missions that were flown between 1981 and 2011. And those missions were things like carrying payloads, doing crew rotations for space stations, recovery of satellites. We would not have the Hubble today were it not for the shuttle mission. We would not have the docking ports on the space station Mir or the International Space Station if it wasn't for the shuttle program. The shuttle program enabled all of these other programs to happen. So it was a very important part of space travel history. To date, it is the only manned spacecraft that has orbited and landed, which is pretty exciting. Now, the shuttle program itself, NASA asked for up to $14 billion for STS. Congress approved 5.5 billion. What do you think they did? Well, they took the money, right? But by taking the money, they had to cut corners, absolutely. They had to look at what they had laid out as, as a forecast to say this is a $14 billion program, we're only getting five and a half, how can we manage this to make it work because they needed to make it work, okay? So let's kind of go back in time a little bit to look at why. We have to understand history. The Apollo program was the manned space flight program, 1967. 
It was conceived during the Eisenhower administration. It was a follow-up to Project Mercury. Little, little tidbit for you there. The Mercury capsule could only hold one astronaut, and that was a problem. Because with only one astronaut, that astronaut has to be everything. He has to be the pilot. He's got to be the scientist. He's got to be the, the whatever, right? All these things in one. So the, the, uh, the Apollo program then was created to allow three people to fly into space. Now we've got some options. We've got one person who's the pilot, and then we can have mission specialists in the other parts of the program. Now we can start doing some things. We can do science, right? We can do experimentation, what have you. The goal that John F. Kennedy set out was to eventually put a man on the moon, okay? So landing men on the moon by the end of 1989, it required really the most sudden burst of technological creativity we've ever seen. $24 billion was committed to the Apollo program. 400,000 people were employed directly or indirectly as a result of the Apollo program, supported by 20,000 financial institutions and universities. A massive undertaking all under the auspice of putting a person on the moon. So the Apollo program, especially for the time, $24 billion in 1967, 1966, this is a tremendous amount of money. And so people are not sure if we should be doing this. What's the goal? What's the point? Why would we do this? And all these questions are being asked, but we're pursuing it. In February 1967, we had the Apollo 1 disaster, where Grissom, White, and Chafee died on the launch pad during a test when the, the capsule caught fire and they did not have a proper escape route uh, for the capsule, right? On March, uh, March of 1969, Apollo 9, which is the first manned spaceflight test of the lunar module, happens and then in July 20th, three months later, Apollo 11 lands men on the moon. So between 1967 and 1969, we learned enough about what we needed to do to never lose human life again. Three astronauts lost their lives in 67. Remember that, that's an important point. But then three years later, we made the moon landing. We did what we, we needed to do, right? So tremendous success. This was an amazing accomplishment for the space program. And they completed it in a compressed time frame, which means as far as risk management goes, they had to make sure that they, they incorporated all of the elements of risk to be able to do this, especially in a compressed time frame. So the Apollo program, massively successful. However, massive success sometimes sets you up for failure because now you have to live up to your past. This is what happens to us today. When we get caught in these same kinds of cycles in InfoSec and we have things that are massively successful, products are deployed, companies grow, and they do these things and they go, it's never happened before, why would it happen again, right? We sort of become victims of the success of our past. So it's really important to understand, Apollo is really successful. So when the shuttle program comes in, when STS starts its stuff, they have to build on the successes of the past, which immediately means what? Political pressure, right? We've got massive amounts of political pressure. But NASA's strong, right? And NASA will persevere. One of the biggest pieces of political pressure they had on shuttle mission 25 was this woman, anybody know who this is? That's Krista McAuliffe. Krista McAuliffe is significant because she was to be the first civilian in space. Not just the first civilian in space, the first teacher in space. She was chosen from 16,000 applicants to go through astronaut training, train with astronauts, fly in the space shuttle program, and deliver a lesson from space, which was an amazing thing. The thing about Krista McAuliffe, though, especially if you're younger and you, you weren't around, is she was a media darling. She was genuinely charismatic. She was real. She was some, somebody people could relate to. Now, with Krista McAuliffe going in space, we can all go into space. This is like the coolest thing ever. So there was a tremendous amount of media coverage and attention around Krista McAuliffe because she was such this media darling. Um, she was on all the major media programs, Good Morning America, um, CBS Morning News, The Today Show, that's when we only had three channels, guys, <laughs> all right? Um, the Tonight Show, I mean, all this stuff. She was, she was out there and everybody loved her. Everybody loved Chris McCollum. So let's talk about some of the technical things that actually happened that led to the failure. Remembering we've got these other things in play and they all kind of lead together. So what really happened was 
there's these O-rings that sit inside the solid rocket booster. These O-rings are about 12 feet in diameter, and what they do is they feed through the solid rocket booster motor joints to allow flexing when the, the shuttle is being launched, okay? Because things like air pressure and, and gravity are causing these stresses on this vehicle as it's, it's going into orbit, right? There's this flexing that needs to happen. As heat causes the gaps to widen, the O-rings have to pop back into the gaps and make the seal in milliseconds. So as a flex happened, a gap occurs, the rubber in the O-ring has to expand to fill the gap. If it doesn't, hot gases will escape. If those hot gases escape, it's very, very likely those hot gases catch fire. If they catch fire, that means an explosion, especially because the solid rocket booster is right up against that main fuel tank, the solid, rocket, uh, the solid fuel tank, right? Does that make sense? Everybody got that? Okay. So here's the issue. When they launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida that day, it was 29 degrees in the morning. Here are some photographs from the actual launch pad that morning. These are icicles, and this is southern Florida. This is very unusual. This is a year that the orange crops were completely decimated because the cold was so severe and so bad. All right, so we have this issue with cold. Do you know what happens to rubber when it's very cold? It stiffens, it doesn't flex, and problems occur, okay? Now, we are not a group of NASA engineers. Uh, anybody the NASA engineers in here? No offense, okay, well, at least one. We are not a group of NASA engineers. We understand cold affects the properties of rubber. The question is, if we know this, and it's sort of common knowledge, why do you think this wouldn't occur to, to people running this program? So what happened is the O-ring failed. There was a small escape of hot gas. The hot gas has caught fire. There was an explosion. The explosion is not, by the way, what killed the astronauts. A lot of people think that that's true. The explosion, what it did is it dislodged the main cabin that housed the astronauts, and they fell uh, 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, hitting the ocean at a speed of about 300 miles an hour. And that took about three minutes of free fall. And that's what they think actually, actually killed the, the crew, right? So it wasn't the explosion. So why didn't anybody anticipate this scenario? Why do you think? We know that rubber doesn't work under pressure. Why do you think nobody anticipated this? Oh, somebody just said it. Who said they did? Because you know what? They did. They absolutely did. They knew it would happen. Now, I'm telling you this in retrospect, right? They knew it would happen because we now know they knew it would happen. But the steps that it took for us to figure out why they knew it would happen are all the failures that I'm talking about in managing risk. That's what's gonna come out here. That's what's part of this story. Very specifically, written documentation uh, showed that they had proof that these problems happened with their O-rings, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this man up here is George Hardy. You don't have to remember these names, I'm just pointing them out. George Hardy, and this is Larry Malloy. These were people in NASA who were part of what was going on. When the engineers at a contractor called Thiokol went to their superiors and said, we are very, very concerned about the shuttle launch. We think that it's too cold and the O-rings will not perform if it's under 53 degrees, we think you should scrub the launch. Okay, this is the contractor of the solid fuel rocket booster, right? They go to their management and say, we have a problem. The management goes, well, what's the problem? It's these, these tolerances, these temperatures, we have an issue. We have to make sure that they don't launch. So they have a, a, a convene about 6 p.m. the night before the launch, the management calls up NASA. They go, NASA, we don't think you should launch. NASA's like, what? And these are some quotes. I'm appalled. I'm appalled by your recommendation not to launch. When do you want me to launch? Next April? Here's what you have to understand. This particular shuttle mission, which all eyes are on because Krista McAuliffe is the first civilian in space, has already gone through three scrubs. They've had three times where they were going to go to launch and they didn't. It also is the exact same day as the State of the Union speech by the President. Now, there was some research done to see if any of these things are related and there wasn't any concrete evidence found that these things are related, that their political pressure was so great that they had to launch on that day so the president could talk to Krista McAuliffe from space. But anecdotally, it's probably there. And there are issues with that that we'll look at here in a minute, right? So all this comes out later, by the way, through this investigative body that we call the Rogers Commission, held by, uh, chaired by, um, by uh, Chairman Rogers, 
okay? So this is the Rogers Commission, made up of some pretty significant people. We've got Sally Ride, the first woman in space. We've got Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. We've got Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier. We've got Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Richard Feynman is gonna be the focus of the rest of what I talk about because he's a fascinating individual that really went outside the realm of what he was tasked to do to figure out what these problems were. And I credit him for finding these issues with risk management and really bringing them to light. But suffice to say, these are important people. The two people that I want you to remember though are Richard Feynman, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist on the panel, and this is Donald Kutina. He's a general, well entrenched in NASA, really knows all about the space program. He was a fighter pilot. He, he was involved in many, many, many aspects. It also turns out that he was super politically savvy and a puppet master. And he is the reason that we know what went on today, why it went, why it went on, okay? We also have a special guest that I'll talk about later. Now, one thing you have to understand is I'm a thespian, and so we have this thing in theater where we draw the curtain back slowly, so I'm not gonna tell you who this is now until the end because that's all suspense and drama that I get to build up, and that's good for me, right? So Feynman, or Feynman, however you wanna say it, um, he gets this job because he has this inquis inquisitive nature. They call him up and they say, we want you to do this job, and he goes, I'm a physicist, I'm not a politician, I don't wanna deal with this, this is ridiculous. His wife, Gwyneth, says, all right, look, if you don't do this, here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna get 12 people. These 12 people are all gonna walk around in a group doing things and seeing things and seeing the same things and coming to the same conclusions. If they pick you, they're gonna have 11 people going around doing the same things, coming to the same conclusions, and one guy running around figuring everything out. And he's like, yeah, you know what, you're right. And that was Richard Feynman. He was the guy running around figuring everything out. Chairman Rogers even told him more than once, you're a pain in the ass, stop it, you're causing problems. He actually wanted him to stop the investigative efforts he was doing. Feynman was never really sure where his line was, so he just started crossing them. He's like, all right, well, if you're not gonna if officially tell me I can't do this, I'm just gonna go do it, right? So he had a, somewhat of a shaky start. People were upset with Richard Feynman because he was asking questions, right? And people don't like to be asked questions, especially when they're put on the spot. Now, think about it. We've had a shuttle disaster, it's a national disaster. We've had all this media attention around Krista McAuliffe. It's a big deal. All eyes are on what's happening in the Rogers Commission. People are very, very, very nervous and some crazy guys asking them a bunch of questions, right? What's their first inclination, right? As little as possible information fed. Kind of like working with an auditor, right? When you work with an auditor, you answer the questions the auditor asks and you don't volunteer more information. Now. I love auditors, I volunteer more information. I am a completely different individual because I understand what that gets us in terms of helping us go forward. And so did Richard Feynman. So I like to think I'm a little bit like him, you know, without the brains and stuff, right? But really, Feynman's big disappointment here is he doesn't like the sterile conditions of the testimony because what's happening in these congressional hearings is they're pulling people up, they're sitting in front of a, a congressional inquiry. It has the Rogers Commission there and, and senators and, and congressmen, and they're, they're testifying in front of a microphone, you know, similar to some things we've seen in this political season, right? That's exactly the way it's going. And Feynman's going nuts because he's not a politician. He's like, no, I want to talk to the engineers. And he gets to talk to the engineers once or twice, and they start telling him stuff. And he's like, yeah, I'm really excited by this because he's a technical guy. Even though he doesn't understand, you know, space travel and the space program, he gets to talk to them about their technical problems. And he's like, yeah, tell me about your problems. And he really starts to, to figure out what these root indicators are that wind up being the total problem at the end, but only when they let him talk to the subject matter experts. And that's one of our lessons here, is we have to listen to our subject matter experts, especially when we're dealing with risk. You wanna to go to the people who understand most about what that risk is to get the information to make a decision. That's exactly what Feynman's doing, right? So he starts meeting with engineers, he's making these small discoveries, and he's figuring out that these are smart enough people that they should have known that these rubber seals were a problem. Turns out they did, and they have written documentation to show it. But this is what he's suspecting at this time. He's running around, he's like, yes, I can see, you know what you're talking about, you have all this great knowledge. So really, what's the deal? He makes the first of several critical discoveries. If the technical people know what's going on, but there was no communication, no one has discussed the problems between their flights. Every single shuttle mission, the 24 prior shuttle missions, showed problems with the O-rings. 
they have a thing in, in uh, space travel where they do uh, a flight safety prep check. They do a check before the launch, they do a check after the launch. And they follow their procedures to the letter. Every single one of these checks showed problems with the O-rings for 24 missions. But they lucked out 24 times and it never failed. It was never talked about between flights. And he went, why? Why did you not talk about this between flights? And the answer he got back was, because there wasn't a failure. What was there to talk about? Right? Has this happened to you? Have you had issues where things go wrong but they're not talked about until something goes wrong and causes you to talk about it? Why would we do that? This is 30 years ago. Why are we still doing that? That makes no sense, right? We want to be able to have these conversations. If you're managing risk, risk is all about communication. You have to establish those lines of communication and talk about those things, especially when problems appear so you can discuss why the problems are problems, which is what they should have been doing here. Um, the reports that they, they dug up actually mention the joint seal as being most critical to operations. So what that O-ring was sealing up, it's the most critical piece of the flight. But then the report also says that safe flying can continue if they pass their checklist. And Feynman goes, wait, if we have something that we rate as absolutely critical, why would it not be absolutely critical? Why would we say it's okay to fly? It shouldn't be. Every one of these other 24 reports said we had failures. If it's critical and it's a failure, you don't fly. That's his conclusion. Why are we flying? It's a good question. He also makes another critical discovery when he looks into the computer simulations. They had poor risk tolerance. So here's what happens. There's a few people who are making decisions, and they're making decisions based on their available information. And what they did is they said, okay, if we have a set of conditions that executes under these conditions, and it causes us not to fly, how can we reduce the expectation of the conditions to get us to fly? So effectively, what they did is they took their risk tolerance, which they already had here, and said, we will not lose a human life which came directly out of the Apollo program. Remember, we've lost three astronauts. We will not do anything to lose a human life. The actual quote is something like, if any party disagrees that this is a problem and human life is at risk, we don't fly. But at NASA, they decided to shrink their criteria. So their risk tolerance got lower and lower until they allowed something to happen. Have you encountered this before? Perhaps in your jobs? where we, we know we have a set of criteria and we say these criteria exist for this reason and if we work within these criteria, we know this happens and when the criteria change, all of a sudden we get unpredictable results. That's risk management. The same thing is happening at NASA, but it's a little bit more critical because they're dealing with human lives. Maybe in InfoSec we're not dealing with human lives all the time, but we've got medical IoT now. We should be paying attention to these same lessons. We should be learning from this. So Feynman, um, He's, he's aghast at these discoveries. Like he's just, his mind is blown. The other people are politicians. They're like, yeah, it happens all the time, right? It just, that's, that's the way it works, right? So he's going, no, 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 no. So he's, he's looking like, like, how can we assess this? How can we do this? So he goes to the National Air and Space Museum. And at this point, he's really down on NASA. He's like, I can't believe these guys let this happen. And that was kind of a quote. They let this happen. He goes to the National Air and Space Museum. And the director of, of NASA brings him through there and shows him a film on what it took to actually get the space program going. And something clicked with him, and he went, wow, I can't believe this many people were involved in this massive effort, put all this time, money, and energy into it, and it failed. He goes, I can't believe that. And he changed his mindset from being anti-NASA to being pro-NASA, to go, you guys are awesome, and you do awesome things, and let's find out why you had this failure. And that's what I'm suggesting to you. If you're in a situation where you're facing some real negativity and you're really sort of against what these forces that are causing you this negativity, understand what the drivers are behind those forces. Try to change your mindset. It will help you when you're assessing that risk because it will help you with things like that risk tolerance because maybe you can reduce the tolerance a little bit, just not to the level that you're being requested. That's, that's working. Right? That's moving room. That's you negotiating, and that, that's useful, and that helps. And it helped Feynman a lot. But this is the cool part. So there's a key moment. So General Kutina, remember I told you about General Kutina. He has Richard Feynman over for dinner. 
and he's talking about stuff, and he brings him to the garage, and he's showing him his 1973 Opal, and Feynman knows nothing about cars and could care less. And Coutinho's going, yeah, this is my car, I've been working on it, and oh, that's the carburetor over there, and you know what's funny, I've been working on the carburetor, and I noticed something, that when it's really, really cold, the seals in the carburetor, they don't work right. What do you think happens to seals when it gets really cold? And Feynman goes, well, they don't work. <gasps> aha, and he has an aha moment. This was absolutely orchestrated by Coutinho. Feynman later says in his memoirs, I'm pretty sure somebody told him that this was the problem and he directed me toward it in his way. <laughs> in 2012, we find out he's absolutely correct. That is exactly what happened, right? And I will talk about how that happened because it's brilliant. So the engineer's concerns are starting to come to light. So here's the thing. This is Alan McDonald. Um, he was one of the chief engineers um, I, on the NASA side, I believe. Um, he comes to a public meeting uninvited. So they're having these hearings, these Rogers Commission hearings, and this guy walks up with his engineers and sits down. No, I'm sorry, Alan McDonald worked for Thiokol. He wasn't NASA, he was Thiokol, the solid rocket booster makers. And he sits down and they're like, well, who are you? And he's like, I'm with Thiokol. And they're like, well, why are you here? He goes, because I'd like to offer testimony. And here's what he said. We recommended to NASA that they do not fly under 53 degrees. This is shocking to the commission. They had not heard this before. They heard all this testimony and nobody had said that there was a recommendation not to launch. And they said, well, is that true? And they said, yes, but we reversed ourselves under pressure from NASA, which is exactly what happened. The Thiokol management went to NASA. They said, guys, don't launch. NASA said, when are we supposed to launch? Thiokol went, okay, you're right. And internally, they had some problems where Thiokol said to the engineers, take off your engineering hat for a minute and put on your management hat so we can figure this out, which means we disregarded our SMEs. We disregarded the knowledge that they were, they were giving us. Right? That's effectively what happened. But the commission had never heard this. This is the first time they're hearing this, and they are genuinely shocked. Feynman is pretty convinced that he knew that they had a temperature problem with the O-rings by this time. He's like, all evidence points to the fact that, that they knew. But he has to figure out how to show that they knew without having documentation that, that officially proves that. So, so far, we know that there's problems with the seals that were not properly communicated out. Right? That's, the, that's the suspicion. So we're trying to prove our theory. We know we had problems with Morton Thiokol management bowing to pressure, and we know NASA is accepting risk beyond their tolerance. It's a recipe for disaster at this point. We know this. But again, we only know this in hindsight. That's the problem with risk management. When we manage risk, we manage risk in the moment. And it's difficult for us to manage risk for the future because the conditions of the future change so much which means when you're managing risk and you have constraints, you need to stick to those constraints as closely as you possibly can so the outcome becomes what you want the outcome to be. Does that make sense? Okay, NASA's not doing that. All right, so Feynman's looking for better answers. So Feynman does something that is a pivotal moment in, in the, the discovery. He stages an experiment. And what he does is he gets a glass of water and he's got an O-ring that he's pried off one of the shuttle models that they're using in the commission hearing to use as people are talking about what's where. And he drops this O-ring in the glass of water. Kutina is sitting next to him and sees what he's doing. After about a minute, Feynman reaches for his mic and Kutina goes, no, not yet. Feynman's like, okay, right? He lets another minute go by, he reaches for his mic, Kutina goes, no, 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 hold on, not yet, not yet. Okay, about another minute passes, he reaches and Kutina goes, hold on, he goes, when he gets to the testimony where he's saying this, that's when you do it. Feynman goes, okay. So Larry Malloy is testifying. He gets to this point where he says, and we had no indication. Feynman goes, excuse me. And he pulls the O-ring seal out of the water and uh, he'd had a, a seat clamp on it. He pulls a seat clamp out and the thing very, very, very slowly starts going back into shape. And he has a famous quote where he says, I believe this has some significance to our problem. Because remember, they were supposed to pop back in milliseconds. The press went crazy. They saw the experiment. I mean, this was drama, right? I told you I was a thespian. This is what we live for, right? This is the, the critical moment. Wow, fantastic. This is amazing. And he makes this, this sort of critical discovery that should have been obvious to everybody, which it turns out it was obvious to everybody, but we ignored the obviousness of it in, because of, of what was happening. And that's the politics in play, right? So the press is reporting that NASA is under great political pressure to launch after this. This actually turns the heat up on NASA. Kutina 
is a really keen political observer. He points out that the commission has many weaknesses in its membership. Basically, everybody's tied to NASA. Feynman's the only outsider. And so he's telling Feynman, you're the only one that can really get to the truth of what happens here because you are the person who comes from the outside and doesn't have any emotional attachment to what's going on. He was a, just a fact finder, somebody from the outside. And this is why I say I love auditors, because really that's what auditors are. They're fact finders, especially when they come from the outside. Maybe internal auditors are a little too close to it, right? But external auditors, they're fact finders. That's how they should be viewed. Somebody who can help us determine what these root causes are. And when we're managing risk, sometimes we need an extra pair of eyes to give us that fact finding opportunity, right? We're just too blind by our own pressures, by our own politics, by everything else that's happening to actually see what we need to see. Um, so uh, Sally Ride, for an instance, she, she still had a job with NASA. Um, Feynman was the invincible man. Uh, Neil Armstrong was a consultant for NASA. So even though these are, are amazing people, they've done amazing things, they still have these very strong ties. They're blinded by what they're involved in, right? And some of the other political forces, Reagan had announced in 1986 the shuttle program will within a year put a teacher in space called the Teacher in Space Program. So we are focused on getting a teacher in space. There's a lot of politics behind this because the president makes this announcement. There are people who want to please the president and they're going to do these things. So maybe there wasn't direct thumb to, to, to nose pressure on getting this done, but certainly if you work in the government and the president issues a dictum, you're going to do the best you can to, to uh, make that happen, right? Shuttle launch is the same day as the State of the Union. Now Feynman checked this out and he said, I don't believe that this is true, but here's what I'll tell you. I believe that there were probably some people who were ambitious who wanted to make this happen so the president looked good. So it was an awesomely staged event. Again, there is no direct proof of that, but we can speculate. We can say probably there were people with some ambition and maybe some ego that caused that to, to occur. We've got this frenzied media coverage around Krista McAuliffe, <clears throat> and up to now we've had these significant launch delays. These are all problems that NASA's facing when they decide that they're not going to scrub this fourth time, right? So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying that based on what was happening in the focus of what they had and the sphere of what they could control, there are things, forces, that are causing them to make decisions. And that's what's happening to you when you are having problems managing risk or when you're having problems getting management to understand. Probably what you don't see is some of these other forces that are happening. You might have a CEO that issues a dictum and ego and ambition are getting in the way, right? You might have some frenzy around a new product or service that's being released and you're going crazy going, but we haven't even, you know, we haven't even looked at security architecture for this yet, right? If ever, <laughs> right? Um, all these things will play to the, to the same things that are happening to you. Remember, this is 30 years ago. So the same things are happening today, right? Well, the engineers spoke out. And because of the Alan McDonald testimony, Thiokol is called in for a more probative in inquiry. And they actually ask the engineers, raise your hand if you were in favor of the launch, and not a single hand went up. And they're like, okay, so Feynman goes, let me ask you this, uh, who's your most important engineer who understands O-rings? And they name names, they name uh, Wajali, Thompson, Kappenberts. And he's like, okay, three of those people are here. Uh, what did you think, Mr. Roger Wajali? And he said, I recommended we didn't launch. And what did you think? I recommended we didn't launch. And what did you think? I recommended we didn't launch. Yet the testimony is that it was roughly evenly divided in the decision to launch or not to launch. Feynman's going, that doesn't make sense. That can't be true. You know, you're playing politics and we're trying to get to the root of this problem. Why are we having these issues? This doesn't make sense. So he talks to the managers who say the workers aren't as disciplined as they used to be. So at Thiokol, they're like, yeah, these, they used to follow all the instructions and now they don't. When he talks to the workers, he's like, they're doing everything they were supposed to do. They're doing it by the numbers. When he talks to the, the workers alone, with one manager present, the manager is surprised to find out that the workers wanted to talk about what they did, but they, the managers wanted to shield them from having to go through this inquiry because they saw this congressional inquiry process as being something that was super scary that they might not want to deal with, right? So he talks to the worker, he finds that they're frustration in dealing with change. These are all communication issues. These are all breakdowns in communication. Management thinks that there's a problem that maybe isn't a problem. The workers think that there's a problem that isn't a problem. Stuff is being communicated up that stops being communicated, that's not being communicated down. These are the same problems we're facing today. It's communication based. It's the most important thing we can do, right? The safety officers define failure as one in 100. The NASA estimate is one in 100,000 for failure. 
the difference between 1% and 0.0001% of failure. Why would the safety people think it's 1% and the, the, the ma managers be so far off? This is driving Feynman crazy. He's like, why? Why would we have this disparity? Because of these communication issues. And they chose, at the management level, to accept a, a higher tolerance for risk than the safety engineers, who were arguably the subject matter experts, were giving. Right? Does that sound familiar? Do you hear these things happening? And we need to identify what these things are, and we need to point them out when they do. So the big findings. The biggest contributor to the accident was poor communication. We had critical safety concerns. They weren't reaching those who needed to hear them. They just were not. They were not going up to management. At, in one case, the flight commander at NASA was never made aware that anybody at Thiokol had objected to the launch. And that is a critical communication failure. Nobody at NASA passed that on to the flight commander who would have immediately scrubbed the launch because of that rule, the Apollo rule, which says, if anyone disagrees, we do not launch because human lives are at stake, right? They didn't accept the judgments of its engineers who actually agreed with Thiokol that there was the design flaws in, in what they had, and the testing showed that. And then NASA wanted proof of their stated problem. When they were on that call and they said, we, we want you to scrub the launch, NASA said, well, prove to us that they don't work under 53 degrees. And less than 24 hours to launch, what are they supposed to do? Uh, here's data, the data pretty much proves it, and they're not believing the data that's put in front of it. Have you ever heard that before? Right, that's pretty obvious. Management had faith in the machine. Feynman has this great quote. What is the cause of management's fantastic faith in the machinery? I will turn that on you a little bit and ask you, what is management's great faith in technology today? Why do our managers believe that there's a big red button for security that says, we're secure? Why? Why do you think? Why do you think? What is it? They're not talking to each other. What else? What, what other kinds of things can you think of? A lot of they, want to they want to believe it. Money. Money, right? What did you say? Easy answer, right? Messenger always gets shot. Messenger gets shot. Trust. If you haven't seen a failure, everything is working. That's exactly right. If we have never seen a failure before, why would we see a failure in the future? Here's what I'll, I'll counter with that, though, to you. It's a valid question to ask. You have to prove it. You have to prove why you think it will fail in the future. What were you going to say? Yeah, bonuses, incentive, right, all of these things. But really, what don't, what don't they understand about the fact that we need to have the secure architecture and, and the things? These are the things that you need to think about, right? Complexity is definitely an issue. How do you explain it? How do you explain it, right? A big red button is easy. What you're talking about has all these moving parts, and I don't like it, right? Absolutely. There's, so there's the knee jerk, right? Wow, we don't have anything, and we have to have all this stuff, and now all of a sudden dollar signs start going off, and people have birds and stars flying around their heads because they're knocked out with how crazy this is, right? Just a lack of understanding. So again, it comes back to communication. You need to communicate. This is the most important thing. So the decision to launch contributors. We've got the 1958 Mercury pro uh, Project Mercury operational ground rule, which I've already told you. No manned flight undertaken until all parties responsible felt perfectly assured everything was ready, and they ignored it. This had been in place since 1958, right? The Apollo 1 disaster happened because of a failure of equipment. It did not happen because parties were not in agreement. And there were other launches that were scrubbed because parties were in agreement, but they, they ignored the 1958 operational ground rule. We had Engineers who were expressing the safety of O-rings, um, they had presented a convincing argument to their management at Thiokol. Larry Malloy said the data is inconclusive at NASA. Um, Gerald Mason, one of the managers, take off your engineering hat, put on your management hat, right? All of these things are happening that are contributing to this failure. It's not one thing. That's the lesson here. It's never about one thing. It's about all these things. And when we start to sum them up and they aggregate, it becomes awful. The final launch decision belonged to Jesse Moore. He was informed of concerns, but was told they had approved the launch. He was never informed that they had objected. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. That was the person who could have saved the lives, but he did not have the information that was required to save those lives. 
uninformed NASA management. They had high-level managers. They insisted that they were unaware of things like the recent problems of O-rings, that they didn't have a clear understanding of the concern, and the Marshall uh, Space Flight Center project managers failed to provide information fully to their project managers. All communication failures. Guess what happens February 3rd of 2003? Fast forwarding in time. The same thing happens. This is the Shuttle Columbia. The Shuttle Columbia disintegrated on impact. And what they found when they investigated the Shuttle Columbia was the same failures in risk management that had happened with Challenger happened with Columbia. Why? Why did those same failures happen? That's a whole other talk, right? Their political pressures that were happening at the time. But how can we make it better? Which is really the, the, the core of why we're here. So recommendations of the Rogers Commission that we're going to apply to what we do today. One of their first recommendations was promote astronauts to management positions. Basically what they're saying is make your subject matter experts the operational, uh, manage the operational activities. This is what should be happening, right? We should not have managers managing operational activities who don't understand the operation. Because management and operations are two different disciplines. They are two different philosophies. And when you're involved in an organization that is so operationally entrenched, like spaceflight, you have to have subject matter experts at the operational level, being in management. They recommended that they redefine their responsibilities. And maybe that's something you have to do too. Maybe you have to redefine responsibilities so that people who are right for those roles, as we say, aces in their places, right, that they have that voice that they need to have, that they get there and they get to where they need to be. The commission rec recommended they establish an advisory panel with representation from many different areas and organizations. Absolutely, that's what a, a review board is, like a security review board, right? That's a really great thing. Establish an office responsible for reporting documentation of problems, problem resolution, and trends. They ignored their problem trends. They just ignored them. But you need to have an office that reports them. Changes of personnel, organization, indoctrination, or all three to eliminate the management isolation, which happened. You might not have control over that, but sometimes that shakeup is good. Develop policies which govern um, the imposition and the removal of constraints. Establish a flight rate consistent with resources. If you're in DevOps, maybe you've got way too much in your queue right now to deal with the output. Your flight rate is now being impacted, right? What you need to deliver is being impacted by the queue itself. It's got to be managed. It's got to be focused. It's got to be able to be within constraints that you can manage with risk. And then are you part of the problem? So Malloy explains how the SEALs are supposed to work, and Feynman says in his usual way, he's using acronyms. It's hard for anybody else to understand. We're all guilty of this. Our industry can have entire conversations using 12 letters. That's insane to an outsider. They have no idea what that means, right? We need to work on this. This, is one, this one's on us. So I'm going jump to jump forward a little bit here. The forces working against you when you're doing this is you've got political forces, economic forces, ego, and ambition. These are all things that conspire to work against you, and it's difficult to overcome. But you need to be aware of them so you can manage them when they happen. You may not be aware of, of the politics, so become aware. Ask questions. You may not be aware of the economics. Ask questions, right? Ego and ambition, these are personal problems. These are things we're going to run into, and they're going to be issues. Establishing a risk frame. The first thing in any risk assessment is to establish the frame, include assumptions and constraints. It's so important because that's what you're going to work under when you're managing risk. These are, this is my, my set of tolerance. This is what I have to manage to. And be like Feynman. Feynman is just a pain in the ass walking around asking questions. Ask questions. Don't just assume something is. Ask it. It's really, really important. All right, so let me jump to here. The human component. I've talked to you about Richard Feynman, and I've talked to you about Katina, and I've said Katina was a mastermind. Feynman, in his memoir, said, I think Katina heard it from somebody at NASA, probably an astronaut, that these O-rings had a problem, but I can't prove that. Katina never said a word until 2012. In 2012, he said, I was walking down the hall next to an astronaut at NASA. They pulled a piece of paper out of the notebook and handed it to me without looking at it, and on that piece of paper were two columns. On one side was temperature, and on the other side was resilience of the O-rings. This was a NASA internal memo. So they knew at NASA that they had problems with O-rings and temperature. Now, who do you think gave it to Katina? Who do you think? I've actually talked about that person. It was Sally Ride, who was on the Rogers Commission, who had ties at NASA and with those ties, used it to pass the information to Katina in a covert way. He then took that information, puppet mastered with Feynman, and got the information out. 
right? She still worked at NASA, she risked her career. He still worked at NASA, he risked his career. How could they get the information to where they needed to get it, to where it needed to happen? Pretty brilliant, and maybe that's what you can do too. Pretty diabolical, so you gotta be thinking pretty diabolically. It's pretty tough. So for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. So I'm being asked to stop, which is fine. Do we have any questions? For any of this. Do you understand a little bit more about managing risk, about how it has to be framed and how we have to contextualize it? It's incredibly important to understand as we go through. Before I close, I want to say one more thing. I want to talk about this man, Bobby Billing. Bobby Billing was one of the engineers at Thiokol. Bobby Billing personally felt responsible for the deaths of seven people. So personally responsible that on the day of the launch, he told his wife, I'm going to take a gun into mission control and I'm going to stop them from launching if I have to kill everybody there. That's how personally he took it. After the launch, he spiraled into a deep depression for 30 years before he died this year in January. He took it personally until some people at NASA and other people who had heard his story said, it wasn't your fault. My message here is this. You can be emotionally attached to things and they can really, really, really bother you. But what you have to understand is that sometimes they are out of your control. And if they're out of your control, deal with them as best you can. Don't internalize them, right? Bobby Bling died with a clear conscience, but I don't want you guys to walk away from something with a bunch of negativity just because there were things you couldn't control, right? Things out of your control, they're out of your control. Manage risk the best you can, understand your constraints. That's the big lesson. There's a bunch of references. If you're interested, I recommend reading any of Richard Feynman's books. They're fantastic. Thank you very much.